Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at BabyLock. Did you hear? BabyLock recently launched five new sewing, quilting, and embroidery machines, the Chorus, Ballad, Array, Vesta, and Flare. These new machines come with a variety of innovative features and accessories, so you can prep less and sew more. Visit your local BabyLock retailer to try out these new machines and complete the Sew More Challenge to earn a coupon for 20% off manufacturer's suggested retail price of BabyLock branded merchandise. Visit BabyLock.com to learn more. Hello, and welcome to Sewing with Threads, the monthly podcast by the staff of Threads Magazine. I'm your host, Editorial Director, Sarah McFarland, and I'm joined by our Senior Technical Editor, Carol. Hi. And today we're joined by our Digital Brand Manager, Becca Ryan. Hi, Becca. Hi. Hi. So today we're going to talk about sewing machines, our favorite features, uh, sort of pitfalls to avoid. And this was prompted because uh, Becca manages our social media. And you see a lot of questions there people have about purchasing sewing machines, uh, you know, how to look for them, how to research the one that you want. And we would thought we thought we'd share some of our insights into that. So usually in an episode, we ask our guests five questions. But today we're going to talk about our five reasons we think every home should have a sewing machine. And Carol, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I would say this is not the most important reason, but this is an important reason for me personally. And it is because of mending, because if, if you have clothing and you want to make it last longer, obviously you need to mend it and mending by hand is difficult. And this all leads to my being actually on the staff of threads because when I had a little kid who was about two, I needed to fix some overalls and I didn't have a sewing machine at the time. So I went to my mom's house and used her sewing machine because I grew up sewing there. And that year at Christmas, she said, I'm giving you this money and I want you to buy yourself a sewing machine so you can mend your kids clothes. So I bought the sewing machine. He outgrew the, outgrew the overalls immediately. So I never bothered fixing those. But I ended up sewing my own clothes and I got totally into it. And then a few years later, when I was making a geographical move across the country, I applied for a job at Threads because I was like such a fanatical sewer at that time. And here I am. Actually, Carol, that ties right into the second reason I'll give. And again, these reasons are in no particular order, but it would be uh, home decor and garment construction. Uh, I grew up in an older home with antique furniture. I still have a three quarter size bed. And if some of our listeners will know what that is, that's a size that they don't make anymore. So I have to either alter or make bedding for it. And garment construction has been a, a big impetus to sewing. Uh, ever since I was probably seven or eight years old, I wanted to have unique clothing. And having a sewing machine has enabled me to create my own. And that lets me segue into altering, <laughs> which is another reason that we think you should have a sewing machine. I was the middle of three daughters, and my mother was a really expert seamstress, but she didn't have time to make all, lots and lots of clothes for all of us. So if you wanted new clothes, you needed to be ready to, you know, like make the older sister's clothing fit you. So I was always slightly taller than my, even though I was the middle, I was on the taller side. So hems had to be dropped and sides had to be taken in. But it meant that a beautifully handmade dress could be worn by three people over the course of a few years and still handed down to other kids in the neighborhood afterwards. That okay. a nice segue into my favorite. Yes. Really, but, uh, so um, Halloween costumes, I think you, you both know, and I think anybody who follows our social media knows that I'm a little bit obsessed with costumes. Um, it would say probably 90% of what I've made over the years have, or have to do with costumes one way or another, um, we we uh, s dress up and celebrate Halloween and Fourth of July both equally. Um, so I've been able to make costumes for the kids starting when they were really little and make them for anybody else who wants to participate in a family costume. We should um, put in the show notes one of your pictures of the black and white checkerboard, and I forget the name of the person you're inspired by, Becca, for that costume you made. You know, I've never been able to properly pronounce the name because I'm not. <laughs> but we do have a we do have a post yes. about her, so let's put that in. We will, we will. Okay. That was one of my favorite costumes I've ever made because I used my quilting expertise along with garment construction 
to create a caftan that had a quilted border. So it was that was probably one of my most favorite things I've ever made. It's very striking too. I am going to brag for just a minute because um, something like, it must be more than 21 years ago because this was before my daughter was born. I made my husband a George Washington costume and I don't even remember why he wanted to wear it to like a Purim festival or something like that. And he's had it ever since and he's only ever worn it that one time and maybe maybe there was another time he wore it one night. But he um, has this Halloween got to wear it for several nights to be the ghost of Nathan Hale. So, you know, these costumes do come back. And also he and my daughter at one time won a Halloween costume at school when he dressed as Mrs. Claus and she dressed as Santa Claus. It was funny and a little disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the last reason we were going to mention that every home should have a sewing machine is for upcycling. And I think about garments that have gone past uh, mending stages or it's something that I don't want to alter. And my sewing skills allow me to change them into something completely different. Uh, I think the perfect example is my father's shirts. Uh, my dad is a clothes horse. He loves beautiful shirts from Brooks Brothers, um, you know, Charles Truitt. And they're just such wonderful materials. I'd love to turn them into something else. Yeah, and I think upcycling is a great sort of entree into sewing for people who are creative and have an, an eye for style. You know, you don't have to start out with plain fabric and not know where you're going. You can play around, and if it's a thrifted garment, you haven't invested that much. I think when we were talking about the five reasons, um, Carol, you mentioned some qualities that these reasons bring to every home, too. And let's see, there was uh, creativity, sustainability. Uh, affordability. And can you think of anything else? Oh my gosh. When did I think of those last Thursday and I've already forgotten them? Well, I think, I think all of the reasons sustain all of those qualities. So there, there you have it. Our, our ideas about why every home should have a sewing machine. A great place to look for inspiring sewing guidance by the experts is the Tautonstore.com. Stay stylish at every turn with the 2021 Threads Magazine Archive. Follow Kenneth D. King's best-selling workshops, available now on USB, and learn so much more. Plus, save 30% when you use the code PODCAST at checkout. Okay, today we're talking about our favorite sewing machine features and what to look for. And I wanted to start with some information about sort of where I started. Yeah, when I started sewing... I had a very old uh, metal sewing machine, and my mom's rule was you couldn't leave anything out. So if you started working on a project, you had to put it away. And I just remember being frustrated at how long it took me to set up the machine, do anything with it, and then put it back and put it away. And it had a locking case. And so that informed my later wish for a lightweight, very efficient machine. Now, how about you, Becca? What's your experience so far with sewing machines? I have such a, a long and winding sort of story, which is that I, I grew up with my mom sewing. She um, she actually bought a second house with the money that she made out of uh, altering clothing growing up. Um, so when I graduated from high school and was going off to college, my gift for my mother was a sewing machine, which was wonderful and great. And it was also a very, very entry-level, basic bare bones. And she said, if you find something you're going to do, you know, if you feel like you're going to use it, we'll upgrade you when you graduate college, um, which we ended up doing something different from college. But I kept that machine until, so I'm 51 now. Um, I kept that machine until three or four years ago, three years ago when I started working too, actually, sorry, when I started working at Threads. Um, and I have to admit, I hated that machine. It was so hard to deal with. It was not, I just didn't, I mean, it, it made sewing into a, a chore that I didn't appreciate. Um, and it was, I mean, it was fine, um, <laughs> but it wasn't really fine. And when I started working at Threads, my husband said, you know, if you're going to be sewing a lot more, you probably shouldn't like break down crying when you set it up. Like it probably should be something that you feel good about. 
Um, and he encouraged me to go get a new machine or a new to me machine. So in between, I borrowed my mom's sewing machines and my grandmother's sewing machines and everything was always kind of a challenge. And now I have a new to me machine that um, I absolutely adore um, because I know I can sit down and I can sew and I'm not going to be I'm not going to be challenged by some basic, basic things. I'll be challenged by my abilities, but not by the machine itself. Be- between your old machine and your new machine, is there is there a single uh, feature that you really love, something that was a real difference between the two machines? The, the threading. <laughs> the <self-threader. laughs> I, I didn't even know that existed. So uh, that was just, that was the one thing that I thought I really needed. And um, the other thing, that was part of my frustration all those years is I was getting older and the very, just, just threading the needles, like, it took me forever and I'd be in there with lights and, you know, now I'm just like, it changed everything for me. Um, so I love that. And um, my machine has a really great pivoting feature that I I kind of just really love. There's so many things that just got simpler for me in life. I mean, that's like a, it was like a 30 year, probably a 30 year gap in sewing machine technology that I can't even tell you all the things that I start finding. And I'm like, Oh, I didn't know you could do that. Now that's changed everything. Um, Also because I quilt a lot, the foot that has, and I, I'm, I'm a novice on some of these things, so I don't really know. You're going to have to fill in what it is. The foot that uh, automatically tells you that you're at a quarter or a half inch, quarter inch mm-hmm. presser foot. Yep. Yeah. That, uh, I was like, that's so smart. How did they manage that? <laughs> and then, like, how did it take so long, I guess? But yeah, that, those are some of the things that I think are probably, for anybody who bought a sewing machine in the last 20 years, are like, well, of course they have that, you know, are shocking to me now. How about you, Carol? Oh, well, you know, I started sewing on my mom's Singer machine. She had the um, the Rocketeer, I think it's called. I think it might be a 403 from the early, early 60s. Oh, and it was yes. Top of I've the line. seen pictures of your mom's machine. Yeah. 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 That was the top of the line at the time. It had all the little cams, the little bake light cams, and you could change all the stitches. But, you know, we had, it was always set on either straight or zigzag. That was it. And that machine... That machine is very heavy. And you were talking about having to set yours up because my mom was a seamstress part time. It was always set up in her kitchen. And when a few years into it in my childhood, at some point, she had a custom table built so that she could put it in, set it in there and have a flatbed machine. So I grew up sewing without a free arm with just a flatbed machine. And that machine, even to this day, I, I haven't used it in a couple of years. It It feels like what I imagine it would be like to drive say a Mercedes it feels so solid and and smooth I mean it's not even been maintained in a long time but it still feels really smooth and I love that I don't have complaints about my contemporary machines but they're sitting on folding tables and so there's always that sense of movement when you sew so I like that that heavy one and then when she gave me the money as I mentioned earlier to buy a machine I bought a bottom of the line um machine, but I bought it from a dealership. And so I didn't spend a ton on it. It was probably a couple of hundred dollars at the time. Then it doesn't have many features. I think it has 11 stitches, but it's really good. I still really love that machine. It's small and portable, but it's, it's pretty powerful. And it has, um, the way you, the way you change the stitch width is kind of a dial as opposed to clicking. So you can really set, and the needle moves back and forth. So you can set the needle to any place you want, like, like no, uh, eighth inch or whatever changes. So I like that for doing, um, I used to use it when I was doing like any kind of big job with curtains or something where I needed the top stitching exactly right. I would just, line up the fabric with the foot and then set the needle exactly where I needed it. And then it would go. It was great. But that one has the four step buttonhole. And on my newer machine, there are four or five, one button, you know, one press one button, get the whole buttonhole. And that is an improvement that I would never go back on now. That's like a really important feature to me. Yes. One thing I wanted to talk about is our uh, preference for metal versus plastic machines and electronic versus mechanical. And I, I have vintage machines, 
but I find that the newer machines are just more efficient and I turn to them more often. And I've also found that a lightweight machine, if I have a stable surface or table for it, I actually prefer to work with a lightweight machine. But then again, my type of sewing, sometimes I have to move to a photo shoot. Uh, it may not be the same as somebody who has a permanent sewing studio and is always working in one spot. That's uh, true. Yeah. Are, are there even, are there contemporary all metal machines? Not that I know of. It's probably the question of uh, mechanical versus electronic. And for me, it's what's the variety of things that I want to do with the machine. If I just want to do straight stitch and zigzag, I'm um, not doing a ton of buttonholes, I'm not doing decorative stitching, then that uh, mechanical machine, which may have more metal parts, is satisfying to me. But uh, I tend to do some decorative stitching. The one-step buttonholes are very efficient. One thing I have found, though, is I don't feel I need 300 stitches which some machines offer. I have a machine that I really uh, enjoy and it has a, a number of buttonholes, a number of stitches, but they are single push button selection rather than having to refer to a book or a card to check out all of the stitch options. And when you get up to like 300 different stitches, they can't always display them all on the side of the machine for you to pick from. I feel like uh, I, maybe it's because I had such a long absence of, of sewing with more than, you know, I think my, I think that the one that I had all those years maybe had 10 stitches. I like knowing that I have 300 stitches. I probably use four at the most, but, but the fact that they're there just makes me feel very, well, first of all, it makes me feel fancy, but second of all, it's just, I feel secure that if I ever needed something, it's, it's going to be there. Um, which is just, I, I think it's probably a strange, um, I guess, after effect of, of not prioritizing myself or sewing or a machine for all of those years that I just feel, I don't know, kind of comforted by it. I've also never sewed, I've never sewn on a machine, on a metal machine, but I now have two. I don't think you guys even know this. I have two in my house now that my husband um, got for uh, Christmas or my birthday a couple of years ago. He went and found two vintage machines he bought one and then at the full table and cabinet bought the first one and then decided he didn't like that one and then went and found another one that he liked better um neither one of them actually work so <laughs> it's kind of sweet and he's oh no i'll make them work eventually and i said well, we're one of those families i guess or those couples that have um a lot of projects going at any given moment and he's one of them he's so he's eventually i'll probably sew on one of the I think it's a, yeah, I can't, I don't even know which, which one works and which one doesn't. I have to laugh because my husband does the same thing only with ukuleles <laughs> instead of sewing machines. So I have, I have a number of ukuleles in my house and <laughs> I do play those, but I, I was thinking sometimes like, oh, too many ukuleles, but now I'm like, but it's not a whole piece of furniture with a sewing machine on it. So that's helpful. Well, I think it's funny because I think it'll be there. One of them is currently holding up my other sewing machine. So, I mean, and I think that that that's fine for now. <laughs> it's not the most convenient thing, but unless we have a bigger space someday. Yeah. Well, I, I, I enjoy the design of vintage machines and... I can, I can definitely make most projects, even though, you know, I, I have some machines that are straight stitch only. Uh, the trouble that I've faced in the past is the presser feet. Uh, the presser feet, even the ordinary straight stitch presser foot is not as uh, substantial. It's not as big. I find that the feed dogs, and this may be because the machine's feed dogs are worn down a bit. It doesn't move the fabric like a modern machine. So I tend to not use my vintage machines, although I really enjoy refurbishing them and getting them so that they will work. I kind of get them in good condition and then don't use them. So I'll bring mine up to you. Yes, you yeah, please do. To restore. Yes. Oh, oh and I, listeners. I should give a warning too to anybody who's looking at vintage machines because I have unfortunately done this twice. Always make sure that the uh, you have a few bobbins and the bobbin case. 
uh, I have twice bought vintage machines and then realized later that something, the bobbin case was missing or something was wrong with the bobbin case. And I found a few on eBay and like cords and things you can easily find on eBay. But uh, Well, if anybody's interested in knowing more about them, I would recommend that they look for um, posts by Peter Lappin, one of our yeah. former digital ambassadors. He's written a few times about... Uh, the pros and cons of vintage machines and how to handle them. So maybe we can put those links in the show notes too. And sometimes I'm just drawn by the beautiful design. Like the Rocketeer was a beautiful machine. And I have seen some machines by Adler, uh, a German company, beautiful lines. I wanted to talk some more about features that aren't necessarily advertised or promoted on machines, but I've discovered through time and use that I really appreciate. Um, one, and this is definitely talked about, is a substantial flat bed area. I've had a variety of machines. Sometimes um, the bed slopes away, which is not as easy to use in the particular sewing machine table that I have. And when I'm using the machine standalone, um, it doesn't support the work as much. And another thing is a 5-8 seam allowance mark that is before the presser foot toe, as well as alongside and after it. A couple of machines where they just put it towards the back and you can't only see it when you're maneuvering the fabric. Huh. Now I feel like I have to go look and see. <laughs> uh, one thing that I, I love is a tilt to open accessory bed. Uh, oh, yes. That's, the little yes. drawer, kind of the thing that opens in the front. Yeah. Yes, that little drawer. Uh, some machines, you have to slide the bed off to access the accessories. And, you know, if you're taking your machine to class or you move it around at all, uh, it's just so much nicer to have that tilt open. You can easily access the tools and feet that you usually use. Um, I, I like, like, I like the, a, a nice, nice light over the presser foot, but I find the machine I have now is, um, it's very bright, which I like, but it also creates a lot of reflection off the presser feet. Oh, and to that's me, that actually that, bothers yeah. me a little bit. It actually makes it a little hard to, uh, sometimes it's a little hard to focus on what I'm doing when I'm sewing. And, and that may just be me. And I won't, I, I really shouldn't complain because I'm very happy to have a lot of illumination there. Carol, is it gleaming off of like any chrome surfaces on your presser feet? I think so. And I think that um, that is a surprise to me because I am not known for keeping things <laughs> as super, super tidy and clean there. So <laughs> I, so I, I did take it apart the other day. You know, we had the podcast with Bernie a while back. Yes, Bernie Tobish. And, yep. And Bernie Tobish. And I worked with him on his article. And then I thought, I am so ashamed of myself because I have not cleaned my, my bobbin area because I've done it in the past and it really scared me. I was afraid I wouldn't get it, be able to put it back together again. But in the current machine, I'm like, I'm going to do this. This is, I have to prove to myself that I can. So I did take it apart and clean it and everything was fine. So that's good. That's another thing that I like, drop in bobbin. Drop in bobbin. You mentioned that. Yes, yes. And I think my childhood machine had the uh, front loading bobbin and that's it's just more finicky and difficult. I can still do it, but drop in bobbin is much nicer. Carol, I was also thinking of Bernie's story and how he um, would use fine sandpaper to perhaps burnish and remove any burrs. And I was wondering if you could do that to shiny areas of your presser feet, just sort of burnish them a little bit. So maybe there's not as much glare from the lighting. I could try. I think I have a couple feet that I might have duplicates of, and I could try it on one. I would worry about making them rough and then... Mm -hmm having the fabric yeah. catch, but I could try it on some of those. Yeah. So just a suggestion. I have not tried this and I should not. <laughs> what is that? Don't try this at home yet. Yeah. <laughs> Carol, I also like a machine that has a light over the bed. And I haven't found that in a lot of machines. And in fact, once at Threads, we had a machine that did have a light over the bed. Uh, the light went out. We sent it in for repair. And the repairman did not repair that light because he had not seen it before. We had to send it back again. But yeah, take a, take a look for that. That's very helpful to have a light over the bed as well. Becca, do you have a machine that's sold as a, as special for quilting at all, or is your machine no. meant for garment sewing? It's meant for garment sewing, um, but it does have, I, I do have a couple of attachments and different features that I can, I can do a little bit more with. Um, I, I didn't want to go too far in 
to anything in particular. So I was a combination embroidery uh, sewing machine. So I didn't, not knowing exactly what I was going to do with it. Um, I didn't want to go too far in and I didn't want to spend too much money. I spent um, as much as I could comfortably, um, but I didn't, I didn't know if I was going to be really doing a lot more quilting because I had, I'd stopped for a while. Um, you know, it, I'd stopped quilting. I'd still stopped sewing for a long time. And so I, I didn't know like, what if I come back in and quilting's not my thing anymore. And I go invest in something that's really for quilting or, you know, um, so I would yeah. actually say just in general for anybody who's new or moving towards getting back into it, I think that um, trying to make sure you know what you're going to be doing with it is a good yes. thing. Yes, true. And I was asking that partly because it used to be that the machines that had um, lots and lots of decorative stitches would be marketed as for quilting because you um, could use them for crazy quilting. And then they sometimes came with the presser feet that were meant for spacing out your quilting stitches. And I, and I then was thinking, would that have the extra light over the top because you're trying to uh, follow yeah. in other areas? I don't know. I don't know how they, how they um, you know, sort of decide what features to put on what machines anymore. I feel as though many of the features that are excellent for quilting um, are also excellent for garment sewing. And, you know, as long as you have the correct uh, presser feet that you can definitely work with a quilting, a quilt quilting machine. And they have so many now that are quilting and a garment sewing recommended. Yeah. I yes. I always thought it was marketing. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think I think so. I haven't found anything that I haven't been able to do that I wanted to do for quilting. It has only been a couple of years that I've been really back into it. So maybe in a couple of years more, I'll be like, you know what? Actually, there's a feature that I heard about that I want to use. Although that light sounds really good. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say things that I typically see recommended on quilting machines, like an extended bed, extra area, um, possibly an additional light. That is definitely helpful in garment sewing too. Oh, right. absolutely. I mean, if you're making a, a coat and it's got welt pockets and you're sewing away from the edge in the middle of this big bulky fabric, you want that space. Yeah. Now, as far as stitches go, one thing that I love is an on-demand locking stitch. I have had machines that uh, it, it's built into the, sort of the seam. It recognizes when you start and end a seam, but I like to be able to just put that locking stitch wherever I want it. Do you just push a button on your machine to do that? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Just push a button and it'll make a locking stitch. Um, you know, sometimes I need that at a pivot point or just being able to put it wherever I need it is a very nice feature. I have never had that on a machine and therefore I have never discovered a use for it and now I'm thinking what's been wrong with my sewing all along that I haven't been locking the stitching I'm just sitting over here like yeah I suppose that sounds good <laughs> and that's that's what I was hoping to impart in this whole episode is uh, to give people some ideas of you know things that I've discovered over the years that I really appreciate now and have kind of led to my favorite machines um, of course needle left to right positioning and that is something that Unfortunately, you won't find on a vintage machine and is so helpful, um, especially if it's some kind of very, very tricky sewing. And I want to be able to have the fabric, the, the whole seam allowance maybe under the presser foot, but I want to position that needle so I'm uh, sewing closer or further away from the, the edge of the fabric. Yeah, I, I actually, I love that too. And I, it's funny because my, so mine's electric, so... It, it's just a push screen, you know, it's just, and I just go, boop, and I feel, it's really silly, but I feel like a goddess when I have these opportunities. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, look at me, I'm in charge of everything. I can just move this with a, with a little button push. So, Oh, I know exactly what you mean. It's just the sense of like, I have complete control. <laughs> Are we all control freaks? Just everybody who's so, anything we all I control. Want. I don't see a lot of machines um, that come with this, but if you get a machine with a hard cover, I like to look for one that has a cord opening in the hard cover. What I mean is I've had machines that you can put the cover on, but you have to unplug the presser foot and unplug the power cord before the cover will fit on. And I just think it's a nice thought if you can use that hard cover also as a cover for your machine when you're not using it and still out in your sewing room. 
I does. look at the um, the needle plate and <laughs> try to look for one that is pretty smooth, doesn't have a lot of uh, the seams are nice and and flat between the needle plate and the machine bed, and the the, the throat plate doesn't have any extra holes in it. And by extra holes, I, mean, I had a machine that had a throat plate with some kind of machining or manufacturing hole in it. And I cannot tell you how many times uh, pinheads would catch in that as work was moving through the machine. And it drove me crazy. And I started using that machine less as I got other options. I think I had one that did that too. And I'm sure my current one doesn't because suddenly, now that you mentioned this, I realized that problem has not been happening to me lately. I'd forgotten about it as, you know, sort of an issue that you had to deal with. Yeah. Yes. I think I've worked through with so many machines over the years now, and I have different options available to me now. So that's something that we could mention. How many sewing machines do people have? Becca, how many do you have? I think I currently have, I currently have four plus the two that, that need to get operative, I, but they count. I say three of the yeah. So I guess I have. I get all right. Fine. I have six, seven. Sorry, <laughs> sorry I just needed to count. <laughs> so my I split my time as you both know. I split my time between Massachusetts and and Connecticut. So um, I my mother has since stopped sewing, and uh, so she's got a machine that's mine now. That's there. Plus I have one of her old ones. So yeah, seven. How about you, Carol? I have. Um... One, two, three. There are four in my house. Um, one that I use a lot, one that was my return to sewing starter machine that I carry around sometimes. Um, quite an old singer from probably the 70s or 80s that my dad gave to my daughter, but she <laughs> tends to use my machine instead. And that one, that one is ready to go at some point. I did order all of the special bobbins and stuff for it, but we just don't use it. And... Um, and then there's a machine that I had about 15 or so years ago that I really liked. And that's the one that that was on a table that was below the 38-inch watermark when my basement flooded. So, <laughs> so it was covered with water up to about halfway up. Mm. And it still sews. But I don't... <laughs> I don't use it very much because I, I love it and I want to like, I don't know, one day I'll try to turn it on. It won't work. I keep it for sentimental reasons, but it, it's not really a real machine that I can have. And it's not even like an old fashioned, beautiful one. It's just one that I did a lot of good sewing on that I enjoyed. So, yeah, I still have the one that the one that I, that I got for high school graduation that gave me all that trouble all those years. <laughs> I just can't seem to part with it. I, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, I know. And sometimes you think, oh, maybe there's somebody who's going to want a machine and I can say, take this and give it a shot. I would never give someone that machine. <laughs> <laughs> Becca, is there, anything, is there anything that that machine does really well that you keep it for? No. no honestly, <laughs> I, I don't even know. I, I, it's, it's in my attic with the one that my, you know, my, my mother got rid of this one and gave it to me thinking it would be better than the one that she gave me in high school. And then when my Nana died, they gave me hers and they're all very similar. They're, they're all similar. And I mean, they're, they're fine. They're probably all workhorses. I'd have to get them all serviced in order to really start using them again. Um, but I love my new machine so much that I don't, I can't, it's almost like I feel like I'd be cheating on it. I love it so much. Um, we were kind of joking recently about sewing machines as relationships. Um, oh, yeah. you know, so, right. So my first one was not great. Um, it didn't, wasn't there for me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's kind of a silly way to look at it, but then I've got this wonderful machine now that I can, I can count on. I know it's going to work well. I know it's going to be there when I need to use it. I know it's not going to give me a hard time. Um, it's, it's getting a little too extended on the relationship thing, but it is a very, it's very comforting <laughs> and secure. And I don't really know why I would want to use one of the other ones. That didn't. No, no. I think that's a good comparison because like relationships, I think if it's, if it's proving to be a lot, a lot of work and very stressful, maybe it's just not the right machine for you. Right. It's, 
Sarah, what do you have for machines? Do you have a, do you, I, I, have, don't even know. I think I have seven right now. And I do use, I do use just about all of them. I think I use five of them. And there, there is a machine. I just like the buttonholes. Um, you know, I don't want to use that machine for hours and hours, but it makes a beautiful buttonhole. And then um, the embroidery machines, one can do larger work than the other, but the smaller embroidery machine takes up um, less room in my studio. So if I'm, if I'm doing, if I'm working on something else and I don't need that machine, it's much handier to have that one. So I am not sure how to uh, get down to fewer machines. <laughs> I feel like I'm at, a, I'm at a good spot. There's, there's not a particular machine that I'm looking for right now, but it took me, it took me seven. So I guess I kind of have a harem of machines to figure out. <laughs> to figure out exactly what I needed. Uh, I wanted to talk a bit for, for anybody who is in the market for their first machine or uh, you know didn't have uh, a good experience with a machine that they previously bought about shopping for a machine and our advice there. Now, I feel I've had good success ordering some machines online, but that is based on working with other machines from the same company or you know, really understanding what that machine is going to be about. So if you're, if you're buying a new machine and you're, you haven't had a chance to work with it, I really don't think online is always a good way to go. I agree with you. I would say that, as I mentioned earlier, when I first bought my return to sewing machine, I went to a dealership and said, I have this much money to spend. And they said, this is the one machine you can get then. And it was, it was at the bottom of the line dealership from that company. That company sold machines at half the price at big box stores. And I've seen those too. And the difference is unbelievably huge. The, you know, the ones that you can buy at a, you know, Target or Walmart have a completely different bobbin system. And the tension was very hard to set. And this one that I bought was, you know, I mean, it doesn't have many features at all and it didn't cost me that much money, but is rock solid and really worked well. So I would say, you know, if you, if you're starting out, find a dealership that you can get to. Carol, I have a, a question about dealerships. I've, mm -hmm. I've gone with friends to dealerships and, and students before, and I would say be prepared with what you want to spend and stick to it. Um, because any good salesperson will try to talk you up to yes. the higher model. Yeah, it's it, that's just that's just their business. But I think if if you're prepared with what you want to spend, and and go and no, I'm oh, sorry. Oh, okay. I, I was going to say with the with the dealership that I ended up going to because I was I was a new seller, though I didn't you know didn't really recognize that, but. I went to Joanne. I went to a couple of other places just because I wanted to touch the machines and see what was going on. And I found myself really still lost though. I, I didn't, I still couldn't tell the difference between what I wanted and what was reasonable. And, and if I could get this feature or that feature. Um, and the, I ended up at a dealership. The dealer was so wonderful and she did, she actually didn't try to upsell me. She said, oh, that's good. we want you to come back when you're ready and spend the big, you know, the big bucks in the meantime, if we try to sell you on something that you're not ready for, or you don't want, you're not going to come back to us. So, um, I think, I mean, I, some, some of them are probably not the same, but I did, I did go in with, you know, I think I just want this. And she said, well, how long have you been sewing? What are you doing? What do you, we actually spent a huge amount of time together talking about what I thought I needed. And I ended up with a completely, I mean, I, I don't even know why somebody got rid of this machine, but it's, it was a used machine that had been refurbished and it was completely still in the packaging. Like, I don't, it looked like it had never been used. Um, but I will say, so just while we're on the subject of dealers, one of the things that as a novice uh, or really, really changed things for me is at least at mine, um, with every machine they sold, they sell, they do classes on how to yes. use your machine and you'd never get that if you ordered it online. And I went for, you know, four, four nights, four Wednesdays for a couple of hours. And 
like five other people in the room and she said, you know, here's this, here's what this does. Here's what this does. If you ever have any questions, call right back to me. We'll always help you. And she, they've been there and it was, it's pretty wonderful. Um, and I think it's a really important thing because especially for someone who kind of knows what machines do, but doesn't really know the potential having a class walk you through everything was really good. Yeah, that's something that I think we've I've always recommended people do when they go to a dealership and find out about classes and and support. And you know, you can tell when you go into a dealership, I think, if you're going to like that person, if you're going to feel like there it's going to be a good relationship with the dealership as well cuz you're going to need your machine serviced and maybe you're going to want to maybe you're going to outgrow the machine and want to trade it in and get another one and that's a, a good way to do it. Um, I I feel like I don't have a good answer for people who live in parts of the country where they don't have a dealership nearby. And I know that there are, there are sewing machine deserts people. I'm sorry to have to say that, but I'm sure there are. <laughs> and um, I, I don't know. I don't know what you can do in that case. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts about how you handle that. I actually... <laughs> I, I'm not, I, I sound like I'm in love with her, um, but our, the, the dealers around here at least have an online store. And I actually think if I was going to move somewhere where we didn't have one, I would probably call them up and, and say, you know, I have a personal consultation there. Here's what I've got. I bet it would not quite replicate the experience, but, um, and I'm sure that there are stores I'm sure that there are online stores that'll help sort of do virtual classes or, or provide support at a distance. And I think especially the last couple of years, there's those opportunities are becoming more and more available to people. Well, so that may be the answer is to, you know, contact a dealership and try to speak to somebody and find out whether they can, they can support you even long distance. Yeah. I, I did actually buy a serger during the pandemic and, you know, I just kind of called them and said, what do you have? And they told me, and I took my credit card number and then I drove down and they put it in the trunk of my car. It felt like a, like a weird sort of illicit deal, but I was pretty happy about it, <laughs> but I knew no. what I was looking for. So that, that's a, that's an excellent uh, point, uh, Becca and Carol, is that I think that there, there are online, um, uh, stores that at, at the root, they specialize in sewing machines and, you know, maybe they have a brick and mortar store, but in any case, they know how to talk about the machines and there's someone there to contact for support if you can't actually go to the store. But I think definitely buying through a dealer, um, possibly, I know you can save money, um, you know, purchasing online or going to a big box store. But as you said, Becca, that class experience and that support, is just invaluable. Well, and I think also what shocked me was, I think, and this is what Carol was saying, that so the entry level of certain brands that I was looking at, I didn't end up with the entry level, but even the entry level ones, they were not that much more expensive than, you know, a, one of the big box stores. They just happened to be made by a manufacturer that are made and were made for the dealer. Um, and I, even at, even at just playing with it, touching it and doing a few stitches, I was like, okay, so this is, this is better. This, this is better than spending the same amount of money in a big box store for something that isn't quite as good. I don't know how to, I think that's a good point. I think what you did going to uh, Joanne's and maybe going to big box stores and just checking out the machines there and getting it, that gave you a better appreciation for what you really got. Yeah. Well, my sewing machine is super spectacular. So. And I just need to say, just because, because I feel like a lot of people have said, especially online, I've been like, I know that, you know, machines all cost five to 10,000, blah, blah, blah. When you get into good ones that I did, mine is not even close to that. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it would have been um, new close to five maybe, but I, a fifth of that less was what I ended up paying. And, and I just, I don't want people to be afraid that there's a number, you know, you have to spend $5,000 to get a good machine because you really don't. Um, and um, I know that's sort of out there. <laughs> yes, you really, really don't. I mean, I, I would say that if your new machine costs you $150, it may not be a great machine, but you know, you don't have to go, you don't even have to really probably go to $800. I think you could get something quite, quite good for less than that. Um, 
just, you know, be prepared a little bit. <laughs> well, you oh, and the other thing. And you see, you know, you look on Amazon or whatever and you see that, oh, well, this is a hundred bucks. So sewing machines should cost a hundred dollars because it's what you start to think when you see these, oh, I can get one that does all of these things for a hundred dollars or 150. And I think you, you can, um, maybe, maybe you shouldn't, um, you know, depending on where you are and what you can afford. But um, I just, I know, the, the the numbers seem a little a little crazy when you start, but I I do I do think that one somebody in the office I don't know it was probably one of you or maybe it was Janine somebody when I said I don't know what I'm doing I don't know what to do where do I get a machine was spend the, as much as you can, can and feel comfortable with like I mean within reason don't don't go insane but don't cheap out so there's a space in between there that you need to know where your comfort level is and and then stick to that. Yes. yes. And, I, and, and Becca, the idea of getting something refurbished or, you know, slightly used from a dealer, because it, it, you know, it's like a car, really, you'll pay a lot less money, but it will probably be in great shape. And it may be just what you need. So that's a good reason to go to a dealer and find out if there's anything you can get there. So more machine, less money. And the other thing is that most of the manufacturers do have promotions relatively regularly especially as they're moving out old models and bringing in new models. And if you sort of haunt their websites, you can see what those promotions are and you can figure out, you know, can I save a few hundred on this machine I've been looking at? So look at those and then call the dealer if you can, you know, nearby and see what they have in stock and if they're offering, you know, any of those promotions. I did, I did that with last year when I decided I really needed to have a new serger and I was proud of myself because I spent a little bit less money than I was actually intending to spend and got, a better machine than I thought I was going to get. So that was, that was nice. It's a, a good feeling. Yeah. So I would say look for a dealer if you can come up with a checklist of what you want to do, what uh, a range you'd like to spend and just uh, do some research. There's definitely a big difference between what you can get at a big box store and what you're going to get from a dealer. And if you can go to a dealership, bring with you fabrics that are what you want to sew and really demand that you get to do a test drive. Don't let them just put in a piece of quilting cotton and show you that it makes a straight stitch. Sit down and test it and see how it feels to you. And if you like the way the controls work, if it feels solid, whatever, you know, you may be tipped off to something that you just don't like in a machine. Excellent point, Carol. Well, we've come to the end of our time. I always love talking about sewing machines, and I hope we've uh, inspired, if you don't have a sewing machine yet, I hope we've inspired you to get one, and if you have one that isn't really working for you, we hope (laughs) we've inspired you to try something new. Thank you for listening. Follow Threads on social media and visit threadsmagazine.com to view show notes for this episode. While you're on the site, check out Threads Insider, our online membership with exclusive access to expert sewing techniques. Until next time, keep on sewing with threads.